this topic on pseudo-random numbers and stream ciphers follows some of the things that we've just seen about uh, the block modes of operation. We saw some of those modes of operation take a block cipher and really convert it into a stream cipher. What's the difference? Uh, I guess in theory the difference is how much do we encrypt at a time. A block is usually 64 bits or longer, a stream cipher usually 8 bits. But in practice it's about the implementation or the speed. The idea of using smaller number of bits, a stream cipher, and especially XORing the plain text with some random input is that it can be done quickly. So as the plain text is generated by our computer, and let's say we need to quickly send it across a network, a stream cipher can be better in that case. A block cipher would take more time to encrypt to an entire block. So there's some practical and theoretical differences. And somehow connecting also is random numbers because stream ciphers really are XORing plain text with some random sequence. But there are different ways to generate random numbers. So we'll just briefly introduce random numbers today. How do we generate a random number? How do you generate a random number? By randomly doing it. How do we, but how do we generate a random number? Close your eyes. Okay, so if I say choose a random number between uh, 1 and 100, tell me, 49, okay, you somehow use your brain to choose a random number. How do we get a computer to do it? Math. Any more precise answer? You, RAND, use the, call the function RAND. But who implemented the RAND function? Someone did. It, it wasn't magically arrive in your computer. Someone must have implemented the RAND function. And the, when we implement something in our computer, it's usually what we say deterministic. That is, it's a, a function that it will always do the same thing given the same inputs. Which is not what we think of random. Random is that it should do different things all the time. So we, we in fact have a problem of how do we generate, not as, a, as an application programmer, we can call a library like the rand function to generate random numbers, but the person who needs to implement that library, how do they generate random numbers? And that's hard. Any suggestions? How would you do it? Right, so some math function that takes some, some input number, raise it to some power, applies some complex math operations so that the output looks random. And we'll see some examples of that, some simple ones. Of course it's not random because with any function, if you take the same, uh, same inputs, you always get the same output. Okay, so there is some determinism there. Any other ways to generate random numbers? Sorry? Use the CPU clock. CPU clock goes from 1, 2, 3. That's not random. How would you use the CPU clock? Use noise. Where do you get noise from? Um, from some receivers, some sensors. Some sensors. So you, maybe some hardware. So when you say noise, uh, electrical noise, noise in terms of some disturbances from some audio or, or some, especially in, in computers, uh, uh, noise generated by vibrating components uh, it is considered to be random. That is that the noise, if you have electrical components uh, and as they do things they vibrate a little bit and if you can measure the output effect of that then that's considered to be random. And that, that's a good way to generate random numbers, but it has some problems because you now need some special hardware to do it for you, to measure those things. So there's a trade-off of getting good, good random numbers, truly random numbers, usually requires specialised hardware. You can measure the, um, the radiation levels. So have a, what is it, Geiger counter, 
And if you measure the radiation levels at particular in a general area, then there will be random variations and use that as an input. But that means your computer needs a Geiger counter or something. So to get true random numbers is hard because you need hardware to do it. But the comment about the CPU, yes, you still can use the CPU clock, but how? How to use the CPU clock? It turns out when you do things on your computer, like press the keyboard button, move your mouse, uh, start and do th operations with the software, the time at which you do them has appears to be random. Not the day or the year or uh, uh, even the hour in which you press a key, but if you measure the millisecond at which I press a key and then press another key, the, the milli or even microseconds, those numbers at the end, if we look at them over time, will appear random. Not just of pressing a keyboard key, but maybe hardware interrupts occurring, so different hardware components. So in fact, most operating systems today will use those things like key presses, mouse movement, uh, memory access, uh, hard disk reads and writes, and look at the times when they happen, specifically the very fine detail time, like microsecond, millisecond times, just those parts, and use that as an input to generate random numbers. So we need some other source. We can't just use a function sometimes. So generating random numbers is sometimes not as easy as we think. We can't just use the rand function. What do we expect as the output? How do we know if something is random? Is this random? Is there a random pattern? No, we can see some pattern here. Random? Random? Right, so we can visualize, I think, that there's no pattern in this case that we can recognize, so we may judge this as being random. Or if we look at the bits that represent this image, we may say, well, those variations in zeros and ones are random. But we need maybe a better way to measure and to be able to determine if something is random or not. Okay? So we need some measures to, to be able to evaluate what's good and what's not. Why do we need random numbers in security? Why do we need random numbers? To secure what, for example? Keys are important. I want to generate a shared secret key that only you and I will know. I need to create that key. I don't just choose it from my head. It takes too long to get 64 bits. And maybe I'll just choose the next, the same value tomorrow or a slight variation of it. So we use a random number generator to generate a key for us. If we have a random number generator that is not good, in that the output is not really random, then that gives the attacker some opportunity to find my key. If I generate a key, I think it's random, but it's not really random, and the attacker knows that, then it's easier for the attacker to find my key. So random numbers are important for many aspects of security. So they're used in generation of keys. Uh, session keys, for example, a session may be every time I connect to a web server, I create a session and choose a new key. And tomorrow when I connect again, I use a different key. So across a session, we need to generate random keys. RSA, we'll see in a later topic, is a public key crypt cryptographic algorithm. It needs keys and it needs random numbers. Uh, to distribute keys and to authenticate, again in later topics, we'll see that random numbers become important. Stream ciphers, XOR, the plain text with a random number. So we need a good random number generator. There are different measures of randomness. Okay, that is, given a number or a sequence, is it random or not? Or well, there are different ways to measure some things. Uh, we expect, if we look at binary, a uniform distribution of zeros and ones. 
take a long sequence of zeros and ones, like a thousand zeros and ones, we'd expect half of them to be zeros and half of them to be ones. 500 zeros and 500 ones is one measure of uh, is that sequence of zeros and ones random. But we wouldn't expect it to be 500 zeros, then 500 ones. We wouldn't evaluate that as random. Okay, so we need a distribution of zeros and ones in our number uh, spread out. Not just is an entire sequence have equal number of zeros and ones, even subsequences. For example, Just to have a, a few simple examples to introduce random numbers today and then we'll go into the details next week. Let's say we have a sequence of um, 10 bits. 12. Nicer number to split. 12 bits. And we want to evaluate if it's random. So I'll write some. How many did I do? One more. That's enough. 12 bits, random or not? Is this a random sequence of bits? What, what, why would you say no? Well, one measure is that there are more, there are, there's one zero and 11 ones. One zeros, eleven ones. So when we say uniform distribution, we'd expect about half and half. How many zeros? How many ones? All right, half and half. Good. Random? No. We may say no. There looks to be some structure. Well, another way to look at it then is to look at the subsequences. So, yes, of those 12 bits, half and half are zeros and ones. Well, that's what we want. But let's look at subsequences. Let's look at, say, this six bits. We have six zeros and zero ones. So that doesn't that subsequence of six bits doesn't have this property of an equal number of zeros and ones. That's an indicator that this is not a random sequence, or it does not exhibit the randomness that we uh, that we'd expect. So, not just does one sequence have an equal number of zeros and ones, but the subsequences, that is, the first six bits, should have three zeros and three ones. The next six bits, or any six bits, for example, if we select any six bits at a time, we'd expect, on average, to get the same number of zeros and ones. Of course, we cannot go forever and just select a sequence of one bits. But as you have a long sequence of bits, you can start to apply some measures to test whether one sequence exhibits more randomness than others. So one more sequence. How many zeros? How many ones? What if we take this subsequence? How many zeros? So it's not enough just to, to count the number of zeros and ones. So we need other ways to measure the, the randomness of this sequence. So again, this doesn't appear random. It looks like it's just alternating zeros and ones. So the other one, which is sometimes harder to measure, is independence, that we would think no subsequence can be inferred from others. So if we see some of those bits, we cannot predict what the next bits will be. And sorry, wrong. in this case, if we see, OK, the first six bits, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, maybe you can predict that the next two bits will be 0, 1. So this does not exhibit independence. 
So that's um, another measure of whether this sequence is, exhibits randomness or not. But it becomes hard. So there are different measures to try and to, to compare sequences and see how random they are. It should be hard to predict the next value in a sequence. So to finish today, we'll distinguish between true random number generators and pseudo-random number generators. There's also random number functions, but I will not talk about them. Okay. A true random number generator, we think, is something that takes some source that measures the physical environment to get uh, a sequence of numbers which we can say are random. So radiation events from the environment, maybe electrical circuits and how things vibrate, the noise from different environments, measure them and it's uh, under certain circumstances people believe that they exhibit randomness and they generate true random numbers for us. But, and even mouse and keyboard activity, the timing when different things happen and we can e extract uh, the events and get a true random number generator. The problem is that such uh, techniques for generating random numbers are inconvenient. We maybe need some extra hardware or some dedicated things to make these measurements. So they're not general purpose solutions like a piece of software. And that they often just generate a small number of values over time. So if I want to generate uh, I need a, a one million bit sequence which is random then a true random number generator may take days to generate such a sequence, which is not very convenient. So we talk about pseudo-random number generators. They're not, not real, real true number generators. They are fake or pretend ones. They use algorithms that we can implement in hardware or software. They're deterministic, and we calculate random numbers. And we talk about them being relative, relatively random. And often they take an input, which we call a seed, where that may come from a true random number generator. So we'll use a true random number generator to act as an input to a pseudo-random number generator. And that can produce larger sequences of random bits, which are more useful for applications and software. We will, we will look at some example pseudo-random number generators and uh, look at some of the properties of them and, and how to compare them next week.